So hello everyone, I'm Norman Walberger. We're here at the University of New South Wales and today we're going to move into the topic of surfaces in this course on differential geometry. So we've been talking quite a lot about curves and going from curves to surfaces is a big step. And in some sense, it's going to the heart of the matter because differential geometry is really about uh, surfaces in, in three-dimensional space. That's really the, the main motivating uh, historical aspect of the subject. Now, there's quite a lot of different aspects or different points of view that we could possibly take about surfaces. And we're going to try to keep a rather flexible approach to things, try to have... Um, uh, point of view that incorporates a lot of different aspects of surfaces. So it'll be a little bit wider than the traditional treatment of surfaces that you find in most standard textbooks. So we might start by saying that some surfaces uh, require more than three dimensions. In particular, there are these non-orientable surfaces, uh, the prominently the uh, projective plane, and the Klein bottle. And there are others that require us to be living in four dimensions sort of to see them properly. So mostly we're not going to talk too much about this. We're going to, we're going to stay mostly in 3D. Okay, there's also... Um, the emphasis in most courses on smooth surfaces. So smooth surfaces are sometimes maybe called uh, two, two manifolds. So these are surfaces that are everywhere like two-dimensional space in a nice smooth way. These are uh, very familiar and sort of core objects. But we also want to go beyond them. Because a lot of the interest of surfaces is coming from the algebraic geometry point of view, where surfaces there are varieties, but they're actually quite accessible to a differential geometry kind of analysis. So we're also going to be interested in algebraic surfaces, which can have various singularities and um, places where differentiability breaks down. The subject naturally connects to topology and there is a topological classification of smooth or continuous surfaces actually, smooth orientable surfaces, or maybe we should say two manifolds. And the, the basic list is that there is a sphere, which is usually denoted S2, and then there is a torus, often denoted T, and then there are various generalizations of a torus, torus with two holes, a torus with three holes, and so on. And there's also uh, a number associated with these things called the Euler characteristic, chi. 
So for the sphere, the Euler characteristic is two, and for the torus, it's zero, and then for this thing, it's minus two, and then minus four, and so on. So chi is the Euler characteristic. which is an important topological, it's the most important topological invariant that we will, uh, we will talk about. So we're gonna talk about this classification at some point. It's probably not bad to see it at the beginning. I should also say these are classification of smooth, orientable manifolds, which are also compact. So I, there's an, an extra adjective which I need to put in front of here, compact. And what does compact mean? It means that the surface can fit into some bounded region of space. And it doesn't have any sort of holes in it, so it contains all its limit points. It's kind of a technical condition, but it means that it's, uh, yeah, it's sort of, it's uh, something that you could put inside a box and it's very nice and smooth. Everything is a lot like uh, a piece of the plane. All right, non-compact, Two manifolds are much harder to classify. So things that go off in towards infinity are much more complicated. But they include a lot of algebraic curves. typical algebraic curve, which is given by P of x, y, z equals zero, where P is a polynomial. All right, what about the orientability? We should say a few words about that. What does that mean? So a surface is orientable Well, let's just talk about orientability. So that can be described in a, a couple of different ways. So if we have some surface, let's draw it as a two-hole torus, but it could be a general surface. One way of saying what an oriented structure is is in terms of a normal vector. So if at every point we can draw a normal vector, which is perpendicular to the actual surface of the, the surface, and we can do this continuously. So as we go all the way around, every place there is a, say, a normal unit normal perhaps that goes all the way around and it's nice and continuous, then that's called uh, an orientation. So normal vector defined at all points. That is sometimes called an orientation. So there's an equivalent way of thinking about this in terms of just staying on the surface, which once you think of having a normal at every point, then you can use a right-handed rule to define an orientation of a circle on the surface of, well, on the surface. So if you have a little circle somewhere on the actual surface that we're talking about, then having a normal vector allows us to give a consistent positive direction to any such small circle. So this is really equivalent to a consistent choice of positive direction on small circles on the surface. That's a more intrinsic way of saying it. That doesn't involve you having to go outside of the surface into the three-dimensional ambient space. Okay, so what kinds of surfaces are we gonna be talking about? 
Well, there's quite a lot of uh, different surfaces. And we're going to have a generally have two different points of view towards them. We might make a little distinction here. Algebraic surfaces on the one hand and parametric surfaces on the other hand. So this mirror is the kind of dichotomy that we had for curves. We could define a curve algebraically, or we could define it in terms of parameters. So similarly with the surface, we could think about having, I'll draw it like this, but oh, maybe it'll go up. My pictures of surfaces are necessarily rather loose and, and vague, perhaps. Okay, so here's maybe a surface given by some polynomial P of X, Y, Z equals zero. Or if we're working in the standard coordinate system, we might consider a special case Z equals, say, some function of X and Y, which would give us a more standard plot of a of a uh, function that would also be a sort of special case of this one. <clears throat> and the standard example here is the sphere S2, which of course has equation x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals some number k. All right, on the other hand, the parametric idea of a surface involves, well, this actually goes back probably to Gauss, who really exploited this parametric approach to surfaces. So here what we're doing is we're thinking about having parameters, and let's say they're u and v, and we have a expression that depends on those two parameters, say r, which gives us three coordinates, the x-coordinate, the y-coordinate, and the z-coordinate, all in terms of these coordinates u and v. So for example, the sphere could be described by a parametric form, well, in a number of different ways. Uh, perhaps not so familiar is this one. R u v equals 2 u over 1 plus u squared plus v squared, 2 v over 1 plus u squared plus v squared, and 1 minus u squared minus v squared over 1 plus u squared plus v squared. That's a rational parameterization of a sphere which is just exactly analogous to the rational parameterization of a circle. Well, parameterizations are not unique, of course. So for example, the, uh, the sphere can also be described in terms of, let's say it's a unit sphere, <clears throat> in terms of x, y, and z equals cosine theta sine phi sine theta sine phi and cosine phi where we have some point up here and we have an angle theta with the x, x axis and we have an angle phi from the positive z axis that's another parameterization, the usual spherical coordinates. And here the 
the theta goes from 0 to 2 pi, and the phi goes from 0 to pi. Now we have to be a little bit careful about endpoints. There might be some singularities in the parameterization. So we need some care um, at, say, endpoints where there might be singularities. Okay, there's another sort of a third kind of class of surfaces, very sort of general way of getting surfaces, and that's from complex analysis. So a third approach to some surfaces, rather special surfaces, was initiated by Riemann in the uh, middle of the 19th century, so they're sometimes called Riemann surfaces. And coming from complex analysis, And so without going into a, a lot of detail, if, if you have a curve, a curve over the complex numbers, say, for example, w equals z squared. Okay, that's sort of the complex analysis analog of a parabola, analog of y equals x squared, then we could imagine this in, say, c cross c. We can think of it as a curve in c cross c. But c is itself actually a plane. So this, this graph, if we wanted to graph all these things, it was, it's a curve with respect to the complex numbers, but when we look at it from the, the real point of view or the rational point of view, it's actually a surface. Okay, so it's a curve, it's a single equation in, in uh, say, z, w coordinates. It's a curve in this c2, but uh, interpreted over the rationals or the reals, it's actually a plane. It's actually a surface. Topologically a surface. And in fact for this one, if you include points of in, at infinity, Uh, it turns out to be a sphere. So we should just be aware that complex ana analysis can give us some other kinds of surfaces that have some uh, natural connections to, to uh, complex analysis. All right, so let's have a look at some, some more uh, specific examples of, of planes. Now let's have a look at some more specific examples of surfaces. And let's start off with the simplest ones, which are the planes. So if we're working in three dimensions, then a plane is given by the equation ax plus by plus cz equals d. And that is a plane which has a normal vector given by the vector abc because it can also be rewritten as abc dot xyz equals d. And so it's just everything which is perpendicular to the vector ABC, but translated by a certain amount depending on a D. If D happened to be zero, then we would get exactly the 
orthogonal complement of the vector through the origin. There's another way of thinking about a plane. So that's sort of the algebraic point of view towards the plane. There's a single equation. And in keeping with this sort of duality between algebraic and parametric points of view, there's of course also a parametric point of view to this simple surface, and that's obtained by taking two vectors that lie in the plane. So if we take a vector, say V in the plane, and a vector W in the plane, so V and W are vectors in the plane. So sometimes you might call them direction vectors. Then the plane can also be described in the form. Well, we choose one particular point. Let's say uh, that's the point A. No, A we've already used. Say that's the point uh, P. So we could think of the plane as being the point P and then plus lambda times V plus mu times W, where lambda and mu belong to our field. So this is a parametric form or a parametric view of the same surface. And of course to relate them in linear algebra we learn that to get uh, the normal from the, the direction vectors we just have to compute the cross product so the normal vector can be attained from taking the cross product of any two of the direction vectors. Of course planes are very important because they're not just simple examples of, plane, of surfaces, but they're also important tools to understand more general surfaces because whenever we have a surface and a point, we're considering the tangent plane. And so the tangent plane is uh, just one of these things here. So if we have some general surface, I'll say S, and we have a point P on it, then we're always going to be interested in the tangent plane to the surface S at the point P. And we might give that a name. We might say that that's the tangent to the surface S at the point P like that. Now if S happens to be given by an algebraic equation like P of X, Y, Z equals zero, then one way of getting this tangent plane or thinking about it is to think about the, the gradient of P. So the gradient of P is the vector dP dx, dP dy, dP dz. So this surface S is given by P of X, Y, Z equals zero. Then we can think of that as just one level surface for this function that actually pervades all of space. And then at any one point, say at that point there, there will be a gradient. And that will be actually a vector which will be normal to the surface at the point P. This is a normal to the surface at the point P. And so that's a direct way of getting at the equation of the tangent plane from the uh, algebraic equation of the surface by computing the gradient or the three partial derivatives. It also represents the direction of greatest increase of this function. If we think of this as a function throughout space, here is where it's zero and then a little bit up above it is maybe where it's equal to one and then a little bit above it where it's equal to two and so on. Then the gradient represents the 
the direction in which the function is increasing the fastest. So I hope those are familiar ideas from advanced calculus. Okay, after the planes, I guess the next the simplest kind of surface is a sphere or the spheres, and they're all given by formulas that generalize the unit sphere that I talked about. So x minus a squared plus y minus b squared plus z minus c squared equals k. And we say this is the sphere centered at the point a, b, c with quadrants k and if we want to, and radius, uh, say little k, which is the square root of capital K. They're all very, pretty familiar, but we're interested in, in generalizing uh, spheres, just like we want to generalize circles in the plane. And so a, a one natural generalization is to ellipsoids. So an ellipsoid, let's just uh, look at special ones which are centered at the origin. I have equation, I suppose we could write ax squared plus by squared plus cz squared equals d. Or maybe we'll just you put k as well. Then this is what happens to a sphere when you elongate it in the three axes by certain uh, amounts. And we get this object which in one plane is an ellipse, which in another plane is an ellipse, and which in a third plane is also an ellipse. So it has elliptic cross-section in all three uh, planes. But the shapes of these ellipses are not necessarily the same. In the different directions, the ellipses have different shapes because these numbers A, B, and C are generally different. Okay, there's a special case when the numbers A, B, and C are not all different. So two of A, B, C are equal. Well, in that case, we have an ellipse with a circular cross section. Then we have something that's a little bit more like a football. And uh, then this is a surface of revolution. So it's what we could get, for example, if you take If you take a ellipse, say, in the z, y um, plane, for the sake of argument, that's in the z, y plane, the plane of the board, and then we spin it on the axis on the, with respect to the z axis, spin it, then we're going to get a circular cross section perpendicular to the z axis. And so two of these uh, numbers A and B and C are going to be equal. So we're, this is, we've revolved it around and we get uh, then circular cross sections.
These are particularly more like the standard ellipses because they have foci. If you take the focus of the original ellipse that you started with, you take those two points lying in the YZ plane, then those two points will still be foci of the, the solid, the surface, in the sense that, for example, uh, if you take any point on the ellipse and you take the sum of the distances from that point to the two foci, you will get constant. Right. So this thing still has still has foci. But a general ellipsoid with three different numbers A, B, C does not have uh, foci. So ellipsoids are special cases of quadrics. And quadrics are the natural three-dimensional analogs of conics. And the general equation for a quadric is just a general second degree equation in x, y, and z. So something of the form ax squared plus b y squared plus c z squared plus, I might put a 2, 2d two x y plus 2f x z plus 2g uh, y z. Those are all the quadratic terms. Then we have a few linear terms. We're up to g, say maybe h x, j, y, k, z. And we also need one more constant term, so I'll say plus L equals zero. That's a general quadric in three-dimensional space given by a second-degree equation. Yeah? If it's, a, by definition, a quadric is of degree two. Yes. And of course, as you can imagine, the theory of quadrics is substantially more complicated than the theory of conics because there are a lot more possibilities for a quadric than there are of a conic. But nevertheless, in some sense, these are the natural ones that are after the complexity of the linear planes. After the planes, that's degree one, we get the quadrics of degree two. And they're going to play a very important role in in differential geometry because if we want to look at a general surface, the first thing that we do is we look at it from the point of view of a tangent plane, that's a linear approximation. And then the second thing that we do is we look at it from the point of view of a quadratic approximation, which is essentially talking about a quadric. And we've seen that kind of thing in some special cases already before. Okay, so there are lots of uh, Lots of things to be said about quadrics, and we're going to talk about them. But I want to uh, tell you a little bit about an, another kind of weird object, which was only discovered in the 20th century. So this is uh, the oloid, okay, which was discovered by Paul Schatz in, I believe, 1929. He was a German, or maybe a Swiss, a mathematician, inventor, sculptor, and he had the following lovely uh, idea. He said, let's take two circles. So a circle of radius r in the plane, and then let's take another circle of the same radius in a perpendicular plane, also passing through the center. So they each pass through each other's centers, but they're perpendicular to each other. Okay, so it's just like, like that. Take those two circles, but bigger. 
Mm -hmm. And then what we do is we take those two circles and we take the convex hull of two congruent um, perpendicular circles. So what does it mean to take a convex hull? Well, it just means that we're going to join every point of one circle to every point of the other circle. We're going to look at all points that we can get by going between points of the one thing to the points of the other. Okay? So just imagine drawing all possible connecting lines between uh, things between these circles. And you get a surface that, okay, it's like this and then it's, it's symmetric on the other side and symmetric on the bottom as well. And that's called an oloid. So it turns out to be a ruled surface. It turns out that these lines that I'm drawing here, if I drew them accurately, actually do lie on the surface. This is a ruled surface, and that means that it uh, contains lines or contains line segments. It's also one of the few surfaces that has the property that if you, that if you roll it down a hill, uh, as it touch, if it was, if the uh, the hill was painted, and you just roll this thing down the hill, then the whole surface would end up being painted as it rolls down the hill. So everything in the on the surface naturally comes in contact with the painted surface as it rolls down the hill. And as it rolls down the hill, the center of gravity does a kind of funny thing. It kind of goes up and down a little bit. It wobbles a little bit. So this thing, as, as it goes down, it kind of wobbles back and forth. You can watch on YouTube. You can find some animations of seeing these oloids roll down. It's quite uh, amusing. And the, uh, the thing's actually used, to, it's patented. It was actually patented by Paul Schatz. It's patent number... Swiss patent number 500,000. It's actually used for mixers. So there are these uh, lovely high-end mixers that are, that are based on the properties of the oiloid. So there's some nice problems associated with this wing. The first is to actually parameterize this. So problem is parameterize the oiloid. And of course, preferably rationally. And the uh, second problem is that this would involve a little bit of advanced calculus. Show that the surface area is. 4 pi r squared, which is the same surface area, same as for a sphere of radius r. So you take a sphere of the same radius, surface area of sphere equals surface area of, o of oloid. Okay, there are lots of other uh, surfaces that we're going to consider. So next time I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, well, well, eventually we'll talk about quadrics. So this is um, many people's favorite kind of surface. This is a, an example of a quadric. Okay, it's also a ruled surface. It's what you get when you have a circle here and a circle here and you just join points on the circle. But... Uh, in a kind of a predictable way. So this one goes to that, and then, then the next one over goes to the next one over, and so on. 
but it also, as you can see, it has these two rulings. So there's a, a bunch of lines going in this direction, but there's also a bunch of lines going in this direction. So the center point tower in downtown Sydney, for example, has this kind of shape. This is a very popular shape for architects because when you're, if you want to build this thing out of concrete, these, the, the fact that there are these lines here means that the, you can put reinforcing rods into the concrete in a very pleasant way. And you can have the reinforcing rods going in two different directions which will give it some extra strength. Okay, so that's a hyperboloid of revolution, sometimes called a hyperboloid of one sheet. We've mentioned them before. But there are variants on this. For example, here, I'm not sure if you'll be able to see it. Here is a, a lovely uh, surface. You can come and have a look at it afterwards. It's obtained by the same kind of idea here, except that on the bottom there is an ellipse. And on the top also there is the same congruent ellipse, but they're at uh, right angles to each other. So this one's going in this direction, and this one's going in this direction and we're connecting points on this ellipse to ones on the bottom and just going around uniformly. And if you look at it, uh, hopefully, hopefully you'll see something pleasant as we move it around. <coughs> so hope, hopefully at this point, for the viewers who are watching the video, you'll see that there's a, a sort of a line a pinching line in that direction and then as we go over here there's now this, a pinching line in that direction so these two pinching lines. It's a beautiful uh, surface. It's also of course a ruled surface because it's made out of lines. Okay, so this is not a quadric. This is some more general thing but the, the family of or the subject of surfaces is incredibly rich and uh, there's many unanswered uh, questions and things to be done, even for surfaces in, in three dimensions. So next time we'll have talk about some more aspects of surfaces. See you then.